Hey, welcome back to Business 150, Introduction to Management. And in this video, we are looking at the next topic in human resource management, orientation and training. Orientation and training, it presumes, of course, that you've made a new hire. <clears throat> and so you have to onboard them. And what does onboarding, orientation, and training <clears throat> really comprise? What are the goals? What are you trying to do? in bringing on brand new employees and new hires into your organization. <clears throat> we hope that after the end of this video, you'll be able to formulate the information used in designing effective training programs, as well as describing the different types of performance appraisal that is typically used in contemporary organizations today. So orientation and training right out of the gates. What are we talking about? Orientation is the process of familiarizing newly hired employees with the company, with their fellow workers, with company procedures, with the rule books, with the physical properties of the organization, getting them off to a good running start. Whereas training, as you can see there in the second bullet point, is the process of instructing employees in their job tasks, as well as socializing them into the organization's values, attitudes, and other aspects of its corporate culture. It is, in the best sense of the word, indoctrinating new members of the society into the society's culture. Now, two basic types of information are needed to determine training needs and to design training programs. The first type of information you need description of the tasks and the necessary knowledge, skills, and abilities to succeed in the job. So that's the first set of stuff you need. What is the role call for? What are the requisite KSAs? The second, you see there in that last bullet point, the second is information about how well the employee can currently perform the job. Where are they at? What are they bringing with them to the organization? what is their prior history, experience, education, knowledge, training, and how do you build on that? Is there valuable stuff that they're bringing to the organization you can build upon? Are there perhaps old experiences they bring with them that you want to adjust and correct? Those are the kinds of things all in that second bullet point you're trying to ascertain to be able to have great training. So there's a number of techniques that we are typically using in training these days. There is on-the-job training, there is off-job educational programs, and there is online instruction. <laughs> That's like what we're doing right now. So training methods used primarily for training managers also include things like coaching, committee assignments, job rotation, role-playing, case studies, and training should be directly measured to determine how well employees have, in fact, learn the material. How do you assess? How do you measure? How do you confirm your training was successful and it has improved the employee's ability to jump right in and start adding value to the organization? Now, some things to consider here. On-the-job training typically uh, comprises, well, you have some experience jump right in, start doing these limited number of tasks and we'll show you the ropes. And that is traditionally how uh, for generations uh, we have approached training with employees. Um, if the employee comes with any basic history of experience in some prior position. However, for more technical tasks, off job education is typically required. And so if, for instance, there is a particular piece of software that is absolutely crucial to an employee doing their job well, then you need to make sure they are fully conversant in the software before they can ever start worrying about actually doing the job, right? And this is true whether or not it's a salesperson who needs to use a particular CRM package like Salesforce or whether it's a bank teller that has to learn what is the system that Bank America uses in this branch to record deposits, cash checks, and those kinds of things, right? There is a need for actual hands-on education before someone can really jump in and pull their weight on the daily job. 
Uh, and I remember I've gone through a number of these in different places that I've worked uh, in order to get familiar with particular systems and processes. Now, more and more so, these training packages have been packaged as online instruction so that the employer can take advantage of asynchronous time. And what that means, of course, is that training can be delivered on the employee's time without necessarily having to take time away from the, the job requirement, so to speak. Um, and so there's some question whether or not how full you want to load someone else up, uh, a new employee, on their off time. Nevertheless, uh, more and more so, online instruction provides more flexibility for an employer to deliver a standardized set of training. So some things to think about there, right? Now, when we talk about measuring how well that the training has been digested, of course, a lot of it is a question of how do you assess an employee's ability to do the job? And that gets into the broader topic of performance appraisal. Performance appraisal is a formal measurement of the quantity and the quality of an employee's, employee's work within a specific time frame period. And the argument here, the best practice really is to perform ongoing assessments and measurements as a normal part of an employee's work life rather than sort of the all or nothing annual performance review where, you know, in some senses, an employee may really have no idea where they need to improve or how well they're doing except for 12 months later and then a raise or a bonus is on the line. That's typically not the greatest way to perform a performance appraisal because there's too much weight on the line and many times managers are just concerned about whether or not you're I'm going to give you this raise or not rather than talking about uh, non-monetary terms in which an employee can perhaps uh, consider improving a particular aspect of how they're performing in the job. Now, second bullet point, objective measures of appraisal count tangible products of work performance such as sales revenue, dollar amount of sales revenue, or the number of garments produced, or, or on the flip side, how much waste, how much scrap is produced, which is typically a sign of inefficiency, right? So the third one, subjective measures are judgments, uh, generally by the boss, right, about how an employee is performing and judgments can be made both about the worker's traits or specific job behaviors or how well you're getting along with your other uh, peers. It seems like uh, there's a lot of folks upset with you on the work team or, man, you always seem to be showing up late and leaving early or you don't have the same passion and vigor as you had when you first started working here. I mean, these are all um, the kinds of subjective measures that sometimes we need to assess as well. Um, you need to do those things carefully, of course, right, um, for a number of reasons, uh, including the potential to demoralize an employee, much less uh, step over the line legally what you're able to assess or not. But the point being that both objective and subjective measures are fair game in appraising performance. But the goal, of course, is not that you're trying to get someone to fit in, but you are really keeping your eye on the objective of maximizing employee contribution, value, and performance. And so you can sort of see here in this table reproduced from your textbook, right, there are objective measures, that's the first row, and there are subjective measures, the second row, right, some examples thereof, right, uh, an, obje an objective measure of a marketing manager. The marketing manager reports 16% increase in sales over the fourth quarter from last year. That's awesome. Uh, whereas some subjective measures, perhaps a subjective assessment of traits, the new accountant is dependable, enthusiastic, has a good attitude toward her work environment. No way to quantify that. There's no scale, but that's an encouraging thing, right? Versus behavior-based appraisals, the service quality manager exhibits great leadership qualities, provides clear instruction for employees, maintains satisfactory relationships with customers. So um, you can see examples of that there. And so the point being that when we talk about the topic of orientation and training, uh, very quickly, the whole goal of orientation and onboarding is to get folks up to speed quickly and to do a good, thorough, comprehensive foundation 
that you can build upon as employee remains with the company that they can get started they can start adding value and in adding value they can be encouraged and feel like they're growing and progressing in their role with the company while you continue to build upon that foundation during their tenure with the organization and then this video has spent a little bit of time discussing various types of appraisal that you might perform not only at the very outset but ongoing on a regular basis to help your employees understand how well are they doing what are they doing great and where perhaps are areas where they can get even better over time i hope that's helpful more on this of course uh the more of this content in the textbook that you'll need to review and we'll see you in the next lecture